uh, 18th of September 2022. I'm Dana Drumford. I'm also known as the nuclear proctologist.org. We got uh, serious earthquakes in a nuclear country known as Taiwan. And we have an exceptional super typhoon touchdown and is grinding the coastline and some interior of Japan with winds exceeding 150 miles per hour. Um, they're asking 8 million people to evacuate and expect. Just imagine this, the typhoon is just going to sit there for the next 48 hours or so. Uh, um, Japan doesn't have building codes for 150 mile per hour sustained gust. Uh, most likely that's going to hit 170 plus miles per hour. So that's pretty amazing. We've never seen this pre-Fukushima nuclear meltdowns. Uh, the demonic sadistic IAEA. We got a poll tonight for the sadistic parasitic group known as the IAEA. Is scientific fraud common at the International Atomic Energy Agency's laboratories? And somebody accidentally clicked on no, but the right answer is obviously yes. You have billions of um, insects about to hatch down in the United Kingdom. If, uh, just live for a couple of days. We'll cover uh, exceptional stories that just showed up on the bird flu. And it's, when I show you these stories, it's really, they're clutching at straws to employ bird flu. Nuclear power generation is the only invention that may destroy the future of humans. Not gas, not oil, not coal, not carbon emissions, but nuclear power plants. For coal emissions, for instance, you're talking about huge per particulates. With um, oil, you're talking about huge particulates. They don't travel very far, 50, 100 kilometers. With uh, gas, which is extremely efficient, unlike coal and oil, you practically have no emissions. And that these emissions are indigenous to the solar system, to the planet itself, too. Uh, now, nuclear emissions covers the entire planet. This model is 20 days after Fukushima started. Well, not really 20 days, uh, 19 days after Fukushima started melting down. There was multiple reactors over several days that melted down, and the entire inventories of these reactors were lost. The uh, same with decades of fuel pools over at the top of the buildings. This is one of the many models of radioactive fallout. We actually have studies also coming up. Um, radioactive follow. This was where they were tracking a plume. They estimated it was going to be a million becquels per square meter. This model was the, um, the Norwegian Institute for Air Research model based on 19 days of emissions. This is the Atlantic, folks. This is where we're on to currently. And we've done the whole west coast of Canada up to Alaska on research expeditions. This model is based on just venting, not based on the actual meltdowns. This is a study out of Western Canada of 20 million particles of radioactive iodine-131 per liter of rainfall. Per liter of rainfall. So there would have been 10 times more iodine-132, 30 times more iodine-133, and 31 times more iodine-129, which, of course, showed up in another study. Look at these numbers. So in that same liter of water, with a stunning, staggering 20 million atoms, 
there was uh, 220 million atoms per liter also of the iodine-129. By the way, the iodine-132 and 133 is nine times more effective at ionizing and radiating the thyroid glands of insects and birds and animals and mammals and humans than the 131 iodine, which is exceptionally effective at ionizing and radiating. And uh, thyroid, with these kinds of numbers of all the species, will collect, because you're talking about huge numbers, sustained, and uh, turns it into radioactive hormones, which is generational illness, um, legacy illnesses. There was another study showing 1,500 atoms per cubic meter in California, which was the whole coastline. You can't just have it in California. And another study showing xenon 133 in Washington at 450,000 times above detection levels. These, these are stunning numbers. So you have different isotopes showing up at the same time, quantified by numerous studies from major institutions. So it's not just the modeling, by the way. This modeling doesn't do justice. Now, this is a 16-day model, uh, but this doesn't include real numbers, obviously. But it's, it's a frightening an absolutely frightening depiction of radioactive fallout. This is 16 days when the model stops. Now, unlike gas, oil, and coal, which doesn't travel very far, radiation covers the whole planet from the ocean floor way into the troposphere. It's invisible and it's pulsing energy every second. This is global warming. This has been going on for 80 years, and this was the strata broke the planet's back. So we'll get into the, some die-offs later, and I'm going to cover the earthquakes pretty quick coming up, and, and uh, the typhoon uh, in Japan. We got nuclear news. We got, I want to remind you that the die-off that everybody's claiming in the government agencies and the media is as bird flu, well, this particular area was right in the center of the mass bird flu die-off. Instead of setting their samples, um, their, their carcasses for necropsies uh, to the government, they'd done it themselves. And what they discovered was it wasn't bird flu, despite that was the original announcement. It was actually starvation. So it's pretty suspicious that the same birds were dying a 1,000 miles that way and a 1,000 miles this way, but this particular bunch done their own samples, and this is a huge city. And it wasn't just a couple of birds. You were looking at seagulls and ducks and terns and cormorants were dying of starvation. It wasn't just... No highly pathogenic avian influenza was found. Despite the fact that the state had labeled the day birds uh, originally as influenza, were now examined and confirmed to be emaciated. They had starved to death. The consensus is they had starved to death. And if you look at the die-off along the coastline that has been attributed to the bird flu, which has never jumped to these species in history, and would have warranted a much more biosecurity hazard than what we see they're doing, if it was true, um, I just want to touch on this before we jump into it. We're just almost to the the major news. So, uh, why is all nuclear power plants surrounded by farms? Why did they build them in prime farmland? Stop Sizewell C, and Sizewell and Hinkley Point C. These are two plants they're going to build in the United Kingdom. They both have one thing that's frightening, as is in common with each other, is they're built in, going to build these new plants in the United Kingdom in prime farmland. Why would they do that? 
surrounded by farms? Well, the answer is simple. They're poisoning you through your supermarkets. All nuclear power plants hemorrhage radiation into the environment. I think this one is um, is wind scale. Uh, all the nuclear plants we notice in the United Kingdom and everywhere else, by the way, are surrounded by farms. And when I say surrounded by farms, uh, that's exactly what I mean. It's completely, as far as you can see, typically, is farms and sometimes communities. And this has been going on throughout the history of nuclear power. They're poisoning you in your supermarkets on top of everything else. And the radiation doesn't stop at the farms. All fuel pools worldwide are hemorrhaging radiation into the environment. The IAEA laboratory conducts analysts of treated water. Treated water. Treated water. Now, the water they're talking about is over two sieverts an hour or better. And so gamma would be 20 times more than the beta. Try wrapping your mind around what I just said. Because three sieverts is a lethal dose. So we got a poll tonight, and I'm going to show you why we got that poll tonight. This is a story that came out where they're, they're finally going to Fukushima after 11 years, and they did. Allegedly, the, the, the documentation that was released doesn't prove that they were actually at Fukushima nuclear meltdown site for some reason. It would have been really easy to prove it with a simple video. Now, notice the word treated. In just a small story, the word treated showed up 29 times. 29 times. This is the laboratory. Treat it, treat it, treat it, treat it, treat it, treat it. And so what they're claiming is they got all the radiation out except for tritium. And then the question is, what is tritium? Now they're saying tritium, now we're talking about a nuclear power plant, not something natural. The, they're named the same, but they're not the same. One is considered tritium-3H, the other is just tritium, natural tritium. And pre-nuclear industry was around 1,100 kilograms of natural tritium in all the oceans and lakes worldwide. Sellafield, a reprocessing facility in the United Kingdom in La Hague in France, that has over 500 security guards, I might add. And Sellafield only has 200. There's still 700 security guards for two sites. The releases from tritium is constant, and uh, academic studies have shown they contaminated the Arctic Ocean and the Atlantic, and certainly many surrounding countries in Europe. To suggest and, and try to conflate and equate uh, with natural tritium is is fraud. It's plain and simple. It's despicable fraud. And suggest that you can take 2.2 sievers, not counting gammas, alphas, and neutrons, and by proxy then x-rays, just if you only, only acknowledge which that's all they're doing is beta, which is absurd again. If you filter, say, a thousand uh, gallons well, by the time you've, in just a few hours, by the time you filter just 10 or 15 gallons, you can never get close to the filter again. To suggest you could filter it all out is, it's fraud. And this is why we have a poll tonight, because the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a subsidy of the United Nations, which is also known as the military industrial complex because it's 195 militaries that have been together for over 75 years. Scientific fraud rife at the IAEA laboratories. 
And of course, we have an overwhelming early in the show amount of people saying, duh. They're not a, neither is UNSCLEAR or IRPA or the ICPP, which is all the same organization, the corporation known as United Nations, who doesn't have sovereignty over any country or over you. They can't arrest you. They can't fine you. They don't have any access legally to your legislations or your Magna Carters or your Bill of Rights. Tritium is also a byproduct of operating nuclear power plants. Oh, it's also a byproduct. It's the biggest producer of tritium on the planet, bar nothing. And just two facilities out of the almost 450 facilities worldwide produced more tritium that was on Earth naturally in just the first decade, tripled tripled the natural tritium on the planet. <coughs> With all nuclear power plants hemorrhaging tritium into the environment, for the IAEA to post that story and make these claims is the equivalent of genocide. Tritium has a radioactive half-life of 12.32 years. 120 years with 10 half-lives. How rare it is for them to tell you how many half-lives there actually are. It's so rare, I can't remember actually ever having a story where they acknowledged that they had more than one half-life. It's typically 10 and up to 20. By the time it decays to radioactive lead, it's still radioactive, anthropogenic, man-made lead. This is not normal lead from the solar system. This is a man-made man element. To suggest that it only has a biological half-life in the human body of 7 to 14 days is absurd. Tritium is water. So once it gets in your body, it does incredible damage because it assimilates into every facet of your body, readily, easily, and normally. It's a foreign entity in your body. Your body attacks it with white blood cells instantly, which leaves your immune system compromised permanently. I'll give you a... I, I want to show you how negligent, how criminal, really, that... How should I really put it? Because like, what they've done to the people in Japan, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is claim there was no harm. And first off, they're claiming there was no major emissions. But if you actually look at it, uh, nuclear radiation, by the way, is the most carcinogenic thing that exists. The average absorbed dose is the red bone marrow for adults. Average disposition of not only acknowledging cesium-137. Stunning, really. And this is United Nations acknowledging that these communities, the first, uh, second row is the population in 2010. This row is atomic decays per second um, per square meter. So your whole country per square meter or your whole communities. So each of these communities, you can see the population, and then you can see the atomic man-made, not potassium, not natural, harmless, stupid stuff, but man-made. So they didn't evacuate the people the International Atomic Energy Agency. This is, uh, this is how... how um, how messed up this industry actually is. They're harvesting food in Japan right alongside of one-ton bags of radiation, which was typically uh, 100,000 becquerels a kilogram in the bags, and they're one-ton bags. It's an enormous amount of radiation. To have, to grow food alongside of it uh, is putting people in harm's way. You have to go there and plant all the food. It's a very dangerous environment. It's, it's extremely airborne. To harvest it 
defies any kind of rationale. You would never see any of that pre-Fukushima anywhere on the planet or anything close to this. They wouldn't even suggest it. It would never, ever be a conversation anywhere on the planet pre-Fukushima. So United Nations abandoned all the people in those communities and left them in a nuclear wasteland. Now, it's not just one place that is harvesting food right alongside of one-ton bags. These pictures, by the way, are from the mainstream media criticizing people for saying the farmer has radioactive food and showing you a picture of them growing it, harvesting it, right alongside of one-ton bags in a nuclear wasteland on top of that. that. That is complete Twilight Zone stuff. It's... If I, made, if I told this story pre-Fukushima, Hollywood wouldn't even look at me because it's too far-fetched. It's too ridiculous. Not a chance. It's, it's not even realistic. Good God, man, what's wrong with you? Nuclear power generation is the only invention that may destroy the future of humans and by proxy all species, right? So when you look at these communities, to get to these communities, they're all surrounded by one-ton bags. Millions and millions and millions of one-ton bags. The numbers that they're talking about in this row here, and the population in that row there, this number is just cesium-137. Out of the thousand of isotopes that are going to be there, that's the only one they're acknowledging. So when we have a poll asking, is the scientific fraud rife at the International Atomic Energy Agency's laboratory, then obviously it is. If you think that the international, you got to go past all of these bags to get to the communities on top of that. The IAEA, in most people's mind, would never allow people to live in a nuclear wasteland. We got a call from Michigan. Hello, Michigan. Good. Oh, yes, boy, how are you going? Hang on here. You're going live. You're going live. You got uh, some updates for us? Um, yeah. You know, sad week, month. Um, when I shut down the uh, spectrometer, I was rushing to the hospital. You know, my father was uh, sick with cancer, so I spent, you know, pretty close to the last last month. Wow. And uh, he got his last wishes. You know, my six brothers and sisters got to spend some time with them. So, uh, you know, we told them, you know, but uh, anyways, yeah, that's, that's what happened. Wow, well, hey. holy cow. It's a tough yeah. gig. That's a tough gig. Yeah. Oh, it was very rough. Um, but it was cool. You know. He got his last wish. Cool he got all the kids like, together. That was pretty amazing. Yeah. The parents should never go before the kid, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like my oldest brother's like 66 and, uh, you know, my youngest sister's in their 50s. Uh, but they, I'm the only guy that did it with the uh, nuclear studies. Right. And, yeah. Um, yeah, but that's what happened this weekend. I lost my father. Wow. Yeah, that's... That's, that'll go but, it, but it was cool because I kept him laughing right till his last breath. I'm like one of those funny guys. You know, I'm the, like the nuclear guy that 
brings all the bad news. Yeah, been there. Uh, so that's the way it went. Uh, you know, I love you, Dana. Yes, man. No, you're, I hear you. you're, too. you're doing the greatest thing. You're doing the greatest thing. I try to drop in to bring people the truth. You know what I mean? that, yeah, oh, 100%. You got the spectrometer and you know how to use it. And the numbers are oh, just yeah. shocking yeah. numbers. Shocking. Yep. Yeah. When, I, yep. when I came back into my house after a month, the thing is still sitting there and I, I'm going to do it until I drop dead. Yeah, it's a good thing. You so know? It's a good thing. The truth is such yeah, a great thing, right? I absolutely. Uh, there's no other truth. Like I told everyone on the air in the past, I couldn't find anybody that was doing that. There's not. I don't know of anybody. So, I don't yeah. know. And, and, so, I'm, and I'm at this all the time. I'm, I'm on the prowl 24 hours a day. I haven't found anybody. Yeah, you know, Shocking. Uh, people do other things in different ways. You know, I have other family members and friends and business partners that do other things in different ways. They're doing great. But I had to do this for this reason. I could not find anyone no. that could find the truth with that gamma spectrometry that could absolutely determine whether these uh, isotopes were coming down in the rain or in the food or anything else. There was, That's why I did it. And if you didn't, just imagine, and, uh, right? What's that? Said, well, if you didn't, there would have been nobody. No. And no, then, and I told all of my family members that. Um, oh, one of the things, you know, because, uh, my dad was like in the hospice care. Right. And, uh, my family decided that, you know, a bunch of us brothers and sisters would do that. And, uh, I asked one of the nurses, I said, well, did you see any increases in, uh, cancer or whatever, and she said, one of, the, one, of the she, one of the things she found was uh, younger people are ending up in hospice care. Wow. Younger people. You know, I'm 58. You know, we're pretty much the same age. That's right, yeah. It, she was saying, uh, like, younger people there's a lot of younger people dying, dropping dead of heart attacks, walking down the road over the years. Just uh, last year, uh, not too far from me, a little community, had five people uh, around 40 years of age drop dead of heart attacks in less than two weeks. Just walking Even along the road and playing darts. And yeah, that's right. Yeah, and there was a lot of kids originally reported out of Japan Dying of heart attacks too, right? Yeah. And I mean, when, when I was in high school, we'd like beat the crap out of each other. Totally healthy, yeah. I mean, you might, yeah, I mean, you might get your, like, a black eye or something, but uh, you wouldn't drop that of a heart attack. No, it was unheard of. And then, of course, like you're saying, right, all kinds of palliative care uh, going for young people is extraordinary. It's a very worrying... That's never happened. That's never happened. No, I don't have... In, uh, in the history. It would have to be a serious accident, typically, say, before, and it would be a rare... I, I've been run over by trucks. I, you know, I mean, literally, in dead I'd come back. I mean... Like hit head on on a motorcycle, dead, busted every bone in my body, and uh, they bring me back when I was nineteen. Wow! Well, you know, yeah. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> Art Ray just catching you. up to you now. Yeah. You, you know, in, in the 1980s, I mean, they couldn't kill you. That's fact, though. No, 100%. 100% agree what you're saying. That's great observation that your sister, uh, you got that out of your sister. Anything else you mentioned? Yeah. Um, well, what I'm going to mention is um, one of the great things uh, I've done in my life is, you know, work in troubleshooting and actually defense contracting. Well, I don't know if they're in defense of us, but I worked in defense of the United States or Canada or anybody else when we're in the defense of life. Well, that's fact, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I'm looking. People, yeah. If you met me personally, you. Maybe you think I was a cool guy. You, you know got, a, you got, a, you got a, an interesting life, right? See, so. Yeah, yeah. You know, like all my brothers and sisters were together with my dad over the past month. And uh, you, usually, siblings can't stand to see each other after a few decades. Uh, so the fact that they were, they were still able to. To put aside everything and just get together for the betterment of your dad was tells a lot. Yeah, that was that was that was his last commandment. He was like the greatest man. Uh, do you know why? Do you know why my brothers thought he was the greatest man? Yeah, no, go ahead. All right, I'll tell you because when I was like. Two or three years old, uh, my biological father left my mother, right, and my, my older brothers and sisters were older than me, and this guy, the, the heat was shut off, you know, there was no food, and this guy came in, married my mom, loves my mom for 50 some years I'm 58 over 50 years and this guy came in and just I, I, we were we already had like four brothers and sisters and this guy just came in you know one day we were freezing and starving to death and this guy came in and then we, we were like eating steaks and potatoes and broccoli and put, and he put me through college you know what I mean he, I do so he yeah was, uh, like, yeah 100% yeah, he, was, he was an electrician he was like this great man uh, and and he worked his he worked his whole mean? life and he was happy to raise you guys he was proud to raise yeah, you guys I should say and I stayed till with him right till his last breath. Which was quite fitting, really, wasn't it? He was, yeah. He was like the greatest man I've ever known. He was the greatest man i ever known. And... I mean, that's a wonderful thing, that, right? Trust me. Uh, a lot yeah. of a lot of families, when they separate, don't have those kinds of stories, unfortunately. And uh, he, took on yeah. a, he took on a big responsibility taking on four kids... And that responsibility, yeah. right? And then stuck to it, and then seen it, seen it through. Do. Yeah, and seen it through. That's what great men do. That's fact, man. That's that's a yeah. heart, that's a heartwarming story. Okay, uh, yeah. We'll let you go, and I can't, I can't wait. Uh, I'm sorry for your loss, and I can't wait to to see the future of uh, your findings with the spectrometer, of course, and everything else you want to bring okay. to the table. Gar you have a good night, my friend. God bless. Hugs for you. God bless. And, uh, yeah, I will be there. Okay, my friend. You take care now. I appreciate your call, by the way. Good okay. stuff. Bye. Yeah. Take care. 
Awesome call. Awesome call. Um, so we went back to the IAEA. Um, 35 votes of scientific fraud rife at the International Atomic Energy Agency's laboratory. And they could have found the stuff that Gar found. They could have had a conversation about it, but they didn't. They left these people in these communities and moved them back into these communities, rather. I'm sorry, they never left them, let them leave the communities. They kept raising the limits and kept saying it was safe when it's absolutely not safe. And it's horrifically not safe for women and children, and particularly the females. They're four times more vulnerable. And so the International Atomic Energy Agency, with their own evidence, that's their own evidence, and they're only acknowledging just cesium-137. Like when you abandon, say, a community in this instance right here because of high levels of radiation, you can't remediate that. It's not like you have an uh, um, object that's radioactive or a building that's radioactive but contains, right? It's not contained. It's the entire planet got hammered. And the evidence is here for the communities, but they're surrounded by the evidence by in millions and millions and millions and millions of one-ton bags, which is just 3% of the land. Uh, not just cancer, but how low doses of radiation causes heart diseases and strokes and heart problems and liver problems and lung problems and respiratory and pituitary and thyroid and adrenaline. There's 1,800 illnesses. So you leave these people in the community so you can get a job at United Nations. So you can get a paycheck on it each Friday or uh, a salary or whatever it is. And the people that got the jobs knew the jobs existed and that the jobs meant you had to be evil. You had to lie and leave people in harm's way. And, th and that is their job. The International Atomic Energy Agency's job is not to protect the population, it's to protect the nuclear industry. And it's, and it's not a job. It's a, an attack dog by a military-industrial complex known as United Nations. So... Another silent epidemic introduction to radiation injuries. And again, I'm going to show you and move into the news of how the International Atomic Energy Agency doesn't regulate genocide and murder and omnicide. They, they regulate, they, get, they make sure they get the people that will do that job. Do you get what I'm saying? They're basically recruiters for evilness. So, introduction of radiation injury, a silent epidemic, is silent because the United Nations, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which for some reason the world thinks is regulatory agency, is not a regulatory agency. It's the devil itself. Radiation induced injuries to the visual pathways, radiation injuries to the heart. So, when you get chemotherapy or radiation, radiation chemotherapy, I'm talking about, of course, or radiation, you stand a serious chance, and a lot of these are late and might show up for 10 or 15 years, by the way, radiation-induced kidney injuries, radiation, and they might show up right away, radiation-induced lung injuries, radiation-induced bowel injuries, radiation-induced kidney injuries, the breast radiation injury litigations. So when they claim that water from a nuclear meltdown is treated, that's a betrayal in every sense of the word. Central nervous system radiation injuries. I want, because, like, this is not one offs. They're not producing studies. These people got mortgages to pay. All of these people with their name on that study. And all these studies. They're, they're not wasting the money on a study because they're bored. They're wasting the money, they're putting money into that study because it's prolific. Each one of these. Radiation injuries to the head and the neck. And radiation intestinal injuries, and radiation-induced brain necrosis, which is dead man, dead woman walking, dead child walking, radiation-induced rectal injuries, spinal cord recovery from radiation injuries, radiation injuries to the aorta 
and branch her arteries to your heart, to your valves. But yet they claim that they somehow are good people, that they somehow should be in charge of, and they are. They set the rules and regulations in your communities and everywhere else in your countries, but they're, they're just a corporation. Your country should be setting these regulatory agendas, not this corporation tied directly to the military-industrial complex. How can people at the IAEA be so complacent that they're, they think that this is, they're good people? How does that actually work? Well, they don't think they're good people. They know they're not good people. They can't get the job if they're good people. You're not compartmentalized and have no idea what the big picture is. You know exactly what the big picture is. And that's why they get the job, because they're willing to perpetrate crimes against humanity. Radiation injury to central nervous system of the glands from radiation, radiation to liver diseases, bile duct injuries from radiation exposures, radiation induced skin necrosis, and radiation growth plates, radiation injuries to cognitive impairments. You have latent radiation injuries like the femur finally gives up after about 18 years after their. So when they call it radiation therapy, it's called slow kill. That's what a radiation therapy is. It's slow, destructive, destroy your health, starting from right, right immediately until you're finally dead. One of their biggest betrayals is they refuse to acknowledge that the country is radioactive, despite the fact that 55 countries acknowledges the country is radioactive. And 14 prefectures were banned by 55 countries for a decade, not because of IAEA intervention. They've done everything they could to stop that from happening, to trick you and poison you, and particularly successful in Canada. It's actually 8 million people ordered to evacuate as the typhoon approaches. Uh, this was a super typhoon. Now, when we get to Taiwan's earthquake, remember Taiwan's scale is the same as the Japanese scale on a scale of 7. Uh, i got to show you where the nuke plants are in this country. Oh, that's for the earthquake. Hang on, we'll get to that in a minute. So it was coming in at 170 miles per hour, 270 kilometers an hour. It, it touched and landed and grinding for the next couple of days. Instead of passing through in 8 or 10 hours, it's going to lull there and just grind out the whole. It's going to be uh, terrible, I would imagine. I'll show you. Millions in Japan braces for dangerous storm. I was trying to wrap my mind around it. With around 39 million people exposed to potentially very dangerous winds and lashing rain. Most powerful typhoon of the year, but it's apparently it's the, the most on record. With half a meter of rain. Wow. An unprecedented, unprecedented storms on Sunday, which is the day and all the way up until Wednesday. Winds will be so fierce that some houses might collapse. This is a huge storm, by the way. These, this is not what we're used to pre-Fukushima. These supercell storms are post-Fukushima storms. For extended periods of time, because it's moving slowly while maintaining its strength. So normally when a... These cyclones or typhoons or hurricanes come ashore, they meet resistance, and that slows them down right away. They lose an incredible amount of energy right away. They have a temperature inversion of the ocean and land mass. They hit forests and trees and mountains and, and objects, and that slows them down. They, and, they, and they don't stop and grind. They go right through. They slow down, but they grow through and eventually turn into tropical storms, right? No. Nope. Guess what? No. Because Japan caused, is the catalyst for these 
extreme weather events due to heating the ocean and the planet up from absurd amount of releases and have the world media claiming that multiple reactors melting down that are infinitely bigger in Japan isn't equal to Chernobyl. This assertion now for 11 years is just mind-blowing uh, because it, it points at pure corruption in the entire media. A complete disregard for academia. It's the biggest breach of academia, too, in the universities in human history. And there's been a lot, unfortunately. Dangerous typhoon slams into Japan. Packing 234 kilometers, 146 miles per hour. And I already dumped 500 millimeters of rain in less than 24 hours. Uh, 145 miles per hour is going to be gusting significant. Catastrophic at 145, by the way. These are gusts we're talking about at 145. It's, it's a very hot ocean. It's not going to lose its energy. And it doesn't. It didn't. And they're not expecting it to. More than 7 million people were told to move to shelters or take refuge in buildings to ride out the storm. It's unprecedented. Remember, you know, at Fukushima, it was uh, half a million people evacuated. 3,000 died fairly quickly. They tried to blame it on stress, but in all these hurricanes and cyclones and typhoons where, where 5 to 10 million people evacuated in the last decade... We've never seen any kind of numbers in history that only happened that single time at Fukushima and probably Chernobyl and probably Santa Susana and probably the Kaistum and certainly wind scale. They're seeing rain that has never been experienced before. Seeing rain that they've never experienced before. These are... Incredible statements. Uh, the Kyushu region may see the sort of violent winds, high waves, and high tides that have never been experienced before. That's twice they use these types of connotations. And these are supercells we're talking about. Blow your house down is right. And a total whiteout outside. Visibility is almost zero. It's expected to turn northeast and sweep up along Japan's main islands until Wednesday, which is the opposite of what it's supposed to do. This is what makes it so weird. Scientists, a.k.a. mass murderers, Say climate change has increased the severities of the storm. Cli climate change, if you look at all these extreme events, if you look at the 10 years pre-Fukushima to the 10 years after Fukushima, the difference is light and day, night and day. If you look 50 years pre-Fukushima and 10 years after Fukushima, post-Fukushima, the difference in intensity of the storm is just unbelievable. You know, like a thousand percent more intense magnitudes of order several times and causing extreme weathers like heat waves droughts flash floods become more frequent and intense this is catalyst we've seen is fukushima nuclear multiple reactor meltdowns this is why they try to trick you into thinking about nuclear winter it's the it's it's a nuclear <coughs> it's a nuclear hell Saudi's Taiwan hit by a strong earthquake, and hundreds are still trapped. So when, when I seen that, because I wasn't aware until about 12 hours later that uh, there was a serious earthquake happening. There was two, but with around 50 aftershocks. Now, Taiwan scale, Taiwan scale, and this is the area where the marker is to right there. And this is where the nuclear power plants are to. One up there, one over here. Uh, now the dump is, the nuclear dump was on uh, Orchard Island. I think they had removed it now, right? Don't quote me. 
So the nuclear plants are a couple of hundred kilometers away from massive earth, multiple earthquakes with many aftershocks. Powerful earthquake. And thank goodness there's only one, uh, which is still terrible, one person died horrifically from this. Uh, but if you watch the videos, you can see the whole country shook for extended periods of time. It shook much of Taiwan, the country itself. And this was another city where they had major damage. Which is that city right there, right? Okay, let's get back into this one. They put the earthquake at the international scale of 10, 7.2, at a depth of 10 kilometers, 6 miles. That's an exceptionally shallow earthquake, and they've had over 50 aftershocks. Nearly 50 aftershocks jolted Taiwan after... Now, when they... Because Taiwan don't use the word magnitude. They have a 7 scale. And... And this is the legacy we've seen with the industry, where the, Japan does the same thing, by the way. But what we see is they'll use the word magnitude, even though that's not... It's meant to downplay it because there's a nuclear power plants in the vicinity. So they'll, this is how they downplay it, eh? Some stories were claiming 100 earthquakes in a 24-hour period. I don't know if that's true or not. But 50 seems legit, and 100 seems legit. So let's go in the middle. Taiwan authorities make now this was into the now we're going into the news cycle. I can say there's a, and so the poll we got tonight is scientific fraud rife at the International Atomic Energy Agency's laboratory. 42 votes, 95% of the people said absolutely, positively, unequivocally. That's an overwhelming um, So Taiwan has found by the way, Taiwan has shipped a lot of radioactive food back to Japan. But uh, Taiwan, when Fukushima melted down, had 2,000 nuclear students for several years, the nuclear students, nuclear students in the universities, spammed the internet for several years, challenging any kind of harm from radiation, claiming that it's like a banana, like a potato chip, like walking in sunshine. All, all of these are complete, 100% uh, inappropriate comparisons. Ball face lies, actually. And Taiwan authority recently detected radioactive substances in batches of jelly powder imported from Guma, from Guma Prefecture, one of the five prefectures in Japan around the site of 2011. That's an interesting statement, around the site. Around the site. Well, Guma... You can see where Fukushima is, the black dot. And you can see where Guma Prefecture is, way above Tokyo. So they're not around the prefecture. They're not around the nuclear power plant, let alone the prefecture. One of the five prefectures in Japan around the site of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. But it's not around the site, is it? It's 180 kilometers or something away from it. It's an interesting statement, folks. If they're going to lie about that, what else are they going to lie about? Nuclear food, and by pretending that it's, it's close to it instead of far away from it, decries the significance. You, you can't have Okuma, you can't have Guma radioactive food without everything in between being radioactive. Demonstrated again to Taiwan's Democratic Party authority is sacrificing the people's interest for their political ends, which is exactly 100%. Because they had, what I mean by that is in 2018, Taiwan had a referendum should they import radioactive food from Fukushima surrounding prefectures and Fukushima Prefecture. And the country voted no. 
the nuclear scientists who got the referendum on the ballot actually had to go on a hunger strike. And we've covered him many times. He's a despicable, disgusting, parasitic creature. The Taiwan government authorities say they were negotiating with related merchants to return the batch of food or destroy it. But you can't destroy it without liberating the radiation back into the environment. I'll caution Taiwan. Food containing even small amounts of radioactive substances can pose a threat to the public health if it's taken for a long period of time. It's called bioaccumulation. The more every one that goes into your body, every atom, your body attacks it for the rest of your life. And that leaves your immune system compromised immediately for the rest of your life. And so you're more susceptible to pathogens and viruses that were normally harmless and innocuous and benign. According to the media report, Sasium, which is a British, only the British calls it Sasium. The Global Times is Chinese. It's the Chinese mouthpiece, really. It can be deposited in soft tissues by what we call sequestering, like muscles, bones, and fat. Well, bones are not soft tissue. And it can lead to an increased risk of cancer, but there's 1,800 other illnesses and diseases and not immune deficiencies and injuries which show up before cancer. Cancer is latent. A local politician had told the media that he thoroughly went through some detection materials related to Japanese food in the past two years and found a high amount of radioactive substances that have been detected, even in food imported from places other than the five prefectures affected by the 2011 accident which Chiba was one of them that they actually banned. Chiba's right by Tokyo, 20 kilometers from Tokyo, which is 220 kilometers from the nuclear meltdowns. So if you're going to ban it from five prefectures here, there, and there, and there, and there, then you should be banning it from all 14 prefectures in that part of the country because you can't just skip prefectures. It's criminal, in fact, to skip the prefectures if, if you're supposed to be protecting the population. In any case, two problems, the place of origin of some imported Japanese food may be faked, which we've seen over and over and over and over, and they ship it to other prefectures and relabel it, right? And then ship it to other countries under those prefectures that are not, don't have to provide documentation, certifications, or um, certificates. The safest option is to totally ban such food, which is 100% correct. You shouldn't buy not just food, but any objects from Japan. To Taiwan, especially cars, because you're going to be in it all day. Serious bioaccumulation of doses for you and your loved ones. Do not do so to protect their pro-Japan political stances. So, I hand, so what happened was, uh, earlier in the year, Instead of having another referendum, now that the uh, 2018 referendum is over, instead of having another referendum with the population, they just went ahead and removed all restrictions. It's got a couple of politicians. Britain done the same thing, EU done the same thing, and the United States done the same thing, and Denmark and Iceland are doing it, and um, the EU and the United States lifted all restrictions on the shake of a hand, Biden and and uh, Johnson, by just shaking hands with the next puppet of Japan, right? Krisha. Orchard Island, apparently they closed down Orchard Island dump. So originally the story went this way, was the government, the nuclear industry, uh, the, the, the nuclear industry in the government of Japan, or Taiwan, went to the natives, because that's where they put them, out on Orchard Island, and asked them could he build a canning factory, you know, for salmon and tuna and stuff like that. And the natives said, sure, that'd be great, because we're going to get a little kickback. Uh, so they, instead of building a tuna factory, a canning factory, they built a, a nuclear waste dump, and they shipped all their nuclear waste and but told the uh, natives it was a canning factory for tuna and salmon. But apparently they, they went to court for so long, they f after decades they finally forced the government to move it off their island, apparently. 
It's surreal, isn't it? So I'll take you back to 2020. Taiwan was under pressure from Japan to lift a ban on just because the the referendum was on a, a two-year referendum, which is stupid, isn't it? Because the radiation doesn't go away for a million years. The referendum was only good for two years. And rather having another referendum, the politicians just removed all restrictions. So they can join the Trans-Pacific Partnership with Japan. And what that meant was you poisoned, you bioaccumulation no less, uh, all your supermarkets and restaurants and hotels and, and restaurants and cafeterias and universities and schools and everything else, with bioaccumulation, with endless radioactive food, you can't escape it. So they can get cheaper products shipped into their country. No, this was backdoor handshakes, and the idea is to poison the entire population of Taiwan. It's surreal that that is the, the norm. That is the norm. This is how the industry works. You can get a ban, but you're not going to keep it because the industry will put people in key positions. This should become a hurdle for Taiwan's bid to join the Japan-led Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which shouldn't exist. The last thing anybody wants to do is trade with scumbag Japan. Because Japan hasn't controlled their own, they shouldn't export their their genocide machine and known as food. So we, the last video on uh, Thursday was 2 hours, 12 minutes, and 30 seconds. Today, it's 2 hours, 12 minutes, and 5 seconds. So we lost 25 seconds off my video. They took 25 seconds off my video. And every one of my video, this happens 12 hours later, I'll, I'll lose... Uh, part of my video or gain six or seven or longer seconds to my video, every video. Exactly 12 hours later, the, the length of my video will change one way or another. It's typically longer. But losing 25 seconds is a lot because we cover so much material. So what did they cut out of my videos? Uh, and I hate this part of the video, this part of the... This part of the show hurts me. This, this part of the show I'm not going to like at all. I've got no choice but to tell the story. It's not a good story. I'm, I'm confused anyway by this statement right here. There was a comment left in my last video by, um, it says, at least Unit 4 still has the cap on his pressure vessel. Can't say the same for Unit 3. At least Unit 4 still has the cap on his pressure vessel. Um, this is a tough one for me. So, That's unit four. This is the pressure vessel. That's where the cap is. Way, way up um, where the fuel pools is. It's, it has to be underwater so they can take the fuel out. The fuel can't be exposed to air, see? So the cap of the pressure vessel is equal to the same pressure as the fuel pools. There is uh, number four. There is no cap on the pressure vessel, right? Does anybody have an issue with that? Is there anybody confused about that? You can see to your left, the bottom. Now, this was a 190-foot building. The fuel pulls at the very top of the building, same as the reactor pressure vessel in the cap of it, right? So they stripped it down to that with the homeless and destitute and victims of society. Then they started, they built, um, this framing was built off-site, then they brought it in, reassembled it. Uh, now you can see people over there, these people are wearing paper suits. 
this, these, they burn 7,000 of these suits each day, they claim, right? That's what, that's what they call them, not what I call them. That's what they call them, paper suits. They burn 7,000 a day. We've covered these stories. Now, this picture, they're claiming they're coming out of Reactor 4 building. Look at them. With their plastic bag with TEPCO written on it and their paper suits that with no dirt, no scratches, no cuts, no nothing on it, no tools. And they're, they're allegedly coming out of Reactor 4. Uh, these are, you will die within two weeks if you do something like that. These are lethal doses. This is just walking past it could do that to you in, in the next couple of weeks, see? The stack for Unit 4 right alongside of you see the stack over there? That's 25 sieverts at the ground level today. And, and in a thousand years, it'll still be that. The, the base of the stack is around 25 sieverts. Three sieverts is a lethal dose. Like, they couldn't get into the control room, which is quite a ways away from this building, for seven years. But this is supposed to be 2012, the year after. Breaks me heart. So they claim they built this structure alongside the, the stump that's left. And they did. They built this structure there, the homeless and the destitute. Most of it's done with uh, remote control cranes. These panels, each, you see the, the big white panel up there? That's just a single panel. That's lifted up and gravity holds it into place. There's nobody up there. So they built this structure up over it doesn't physically touch it because it's too fragile there, there's no containment you can um, I'll show you a side view of that so that's that's met one of the many panels where they just laid in there's not physically touching the building there's nothing in the top of it these are just structure they're gonna put the panel around it and claim that it looks like that magically on the inside that's the official picture there's the whole fable right there but they, they, that was 2013, by the way. But you, they never got into here till 2018. Or 2000, yeah, 2018, seven years later. And they can only stay there for a few seconds. Well, we're supposed to believe they're inside the nuclear meltdown and that everything now is hunky-dory. We are here inside Reactor 4 at the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant that was severely crippled during the earthquake and tsunami of 2011, leading to the country's worst nuclear disaster. So she's claiming she's in a building that doesn't exist, in a fuel pool that doesn't exist. So it's really hard to have a conversation with the average person because when you show them that and tell it to them, they can't wrap their mind around it. They're like, that's too much. Why is the media pretending they're in a building that don't exist? Why would it go through all that trouble? Because it's a catastrophic event. So they put the cap on the building. Might as well tell the rest of the story over here. You see in the bottom center, you see all the debris? Now all they done was put... All of them put it uh, panels, not a cap. They put a panels around the structure, around a frame, right? It's just a frame. and But you can see they didn't clean up the debris just because it's lethal doses. You can't actually get near it. And if you can't get near it, it means you can't get in the building. You can't get in the building because there's nothing to go in the building for. But if you listen to Ernie Gunnarsson, and Megat Gunnarsson, or Helen Callercott, they're going to try to convince you the building looks like the building to the left, not the building to the right. Now, Ernie Gunnarsson made the racks for the assemblies for the fuel pools, and if he doesn't know that they don't exist, who specifically does? The division I ran built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors exactly like Fukushima. So the, he, he knows it's gone. There's a, 
the seaside view. And here's the back side of reactor four, it is right there again. So that's one view. Here's another view, the front view of it. The, right, they, they tore it down though, right? And then pretended that it was hunky dory. Now, in the center of there's the remains of reactor three, it was the same as reactor four, where it had the reactor cores at the top of the building and fuel pools in the pools at the very top of the building. Both of them are stuffed because they don't have a repository anywhere on the planet. Over there is uh, shortly after the detonation in Japan. So it ejected the fuel pools and the reactor cores. But what did the industry do? The industry pretended, again, they built it off site, brought it in, laid it there, and pretended Where's that picture? It was right there. Anyway, they pretend that they're in Reactor 3. So they faked Reactor 3 and Reactor 4. On TV, on top of that, no less. Helen Callercott had said that it doesn't look like this. The Japanese are very, very tidy people. It actually looks like that building over there. I put these pictures in. The, the one up to the top is the original pictures from a radio interview. Let's play it very short. The Japanese are very tidy people, and they have, by robot control and by human beings, removed the debris from the top of Building 4, and it does look pristine. Well, Unit 4, you can't make it pristine. It doesn't exist anymore. You can fake it all you want, but it still doesn't. So there's a prime shot right here. You see this, the bottom of this, um, this is reactor four. How high do you think that is above the ground? And if it blew out this part of a 190 foot tall building, this is a 150 foot wide building. If it blew out all of that at this level, it had to blow everything because it blew off 190 feet down to right here is gone. And there's only a stump left, see? So there's nothing functional. There's nothing that big recovered from the building because it's completely destroyed. And that's the remains of it when they stripped it down. And then they went ahead and pretended that it looks like that by putting a, a bunch of panels around it. And this is all that remained of Reactor 3 of a 190 foot tall building. And they pretended that it's a, they built a structure which is 170 feet high, by the way, in order to manipulate you. Uh, what I done was I stuffed the building with people and because that's all you can do. You can't fix it or you can't, there's nothing there. The building doesn't exist anymore. But they have per perpetrated a lie now for 11 years straight. Is scientific fraud Rife in nuclear medicine journals. And that was an article that recognized there's a lot of fraud. They conducted a global survey on the issue. 25% of respondents either admitted to committing scientific fraud or reported they had witnessed or suspected someone of fraud in their department. There's 2.6 million academic studies published each year. Try wrapping your mind around that statement in North America, not the rest of the world, just North America. It's 2.6 million a year funded by the taxpayers. A quarter of them are fraud, at least. Meant to manipulate you and deceive you. And the majority of them will be nuclear. It's very telling, isn't it? Renewable energy storage a priority for, to ensure flexibility, balance, and need, Egypt. Renewable energy storage. Canada located last year $4 billion, $4 billion to renewables for storage. Bruce Power Nuclear Power Plants took all $4 billion, and they're going to get a pumped hydro. Because if renewables... Had they got their hands on money for storage, 
they would have made the nuclear industry obsolete right away. And because there's tons of storage solutions, right? There's compressed air storage, there's water batteries where you have two reservoirs and you pump water to the top one with excess energy and release it when you need it. Countries of the world need $4.7 trillion, but they can recoup it to transfer the energy system and stimulate the economy, stimulate the economy, create a massive amount of jobs. Energy storage will be the pillar of the energy market in the future. Well, it's been scuttled by many countries. Because if you once the minute you pair up renewables with storage, and they only want you to think of batteries, they don't want you to realize there's actual cheap, um, uh, very, very, very uh, effective solutions available. They want you at all costs not to come up with a solution. Department of Energy launches new energy earth shot to slash the cost of geothermal power. Uh, to so widespread renewable energy option in the U.S. by cutting its cost to 90, by 90% 90 to $45 a megawatt hour by 2035. Enhanced geothermal shot Department of Energy seeks to unlock the Earth's nearly inexhaustible heat resources. So the theoretically, if they... Instead of spending twenty-five or thirty billion dollars on a nuke plant, took that and tapped into geothermal at all gas, oil, and coal plants that were appropriate. If you took thirty billion dollars and says we need to come up with technology, because you can take fifteen hundred universities and have a contest if you want to, see, won't cost you nothing. You already pay for 22.6 million academic studies each year. So if you, if you asked uh, 1,500 universities to solve one of the issues, you would. For tapping into geothermal. Because you can drill down five or 600 feet, no problem. Like, like big drill bits, right? After that, the earth starts getting hard because it's baking at... 300, 400 degrees. You want to get to eight, 900 degrees, and you can leave the coal plant, gas plant, and oil plants go right underneath their, their um, supply, which is gas, oil, or coal, and just now leave all the other infrastructure there, just run it off of geothermal, right? And so they can pull that off if they want to. There's no problem. And they, can, they won't need storage. But there's lots of other storage ideas too that work 100% of the time. Like tidal, tidal energy doesn't need storage. And you can predict a tide for 3,000 years. But geothermal is the better one. Because it's, it's the whole earth is geothermal. Switching the world to renewable energy will cost $62 trillion, but will take six years to pay it back. Uh, that's pretty cool. But the technology in a six-year period will change dramatically, right? Let's say it takes 12 years. Let's say it takes 20 years. But they say you can do it in six years with current technology if you wanted to do it. But even if it took 20 years, uh, and then they're trying to build nuclear plants, they're trying to get you away from renewables and sign memorandum of understandings for small modular reactors that don't even exist. So that way you won't look at renewables because you got a memorandum of understanding for a reactor that you still got to create and that they've been trying for 50 years unsuccessfully to create. Just saying. 
The solutions are right in your face all the time, industry. 145 of the world's nations can switch to 100% renewables in a few years using renewable energy technologies available today, despite the advances we see coming. Pilgrim nuclear power station set to unveil water test results. So Pilgrim, which is Holtec, owns quite a few plants. And the big controversy is that uh, they're going to dump it in Pilgrim, right? In the ocean. And the locals don't like it. But they're doing it at their other nuclear sites all the time. All nuclear sites are doing it because there's no checks and balances. The IAEA is not a checks and balances. Their job is to protect the nuclear industry at all costs. Well, even if you've got to kill every species on the planet, it's more important to protect the nuclear industry than it is the species when it comes to nuclear. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the crazy lunatic world of nuclear. Other options include evaporating it. So they say, well, we won't dump it, but let us evaporate it. What's the difference? You're going to liberate it into the environment is liberating it into the environment. It's called a dirty bomb. And the only people that can stop it is you. With no opposition, they're just going to go ahead and do it. And all the sites have been doing it for 75 plus years. Trucking it to a disposal site or some combination. So evaporate some of it, truck the rest of it somewhere where they're going to evaporate it, boil it away. It's absurd. The whole conversation is mind-boggling, straightforward. What they're attempting to do is poison the biosphere, and what they're not supposed to do is poison the biosphere. What they originally got the charters to run these organized companies with was they weren't going to release any into the environment whatsoever. That was the original charters. Evaporating it. Holtec uh, recently released radioactive water from Oyster Creek Nuclear Disease Factory in New Jersey. Uh, the, that site kills around 9 billion fish a year just from its water intake. Around 300 billion are boiled off up the stacks. Each glass of water has a billion creatures. There's 16 million billion creatures boiled alive every minute at each of these nuclear power plants. Because that's what salt water typically has, right? It happens at every plant. And it's something that occurs here for the entire length of operation until about five years ago. Well, the water in the fuel pool that they're still using, by the way, so the water is boiling off into the community anyway. They have to replenish about 120,000 liters in each pool each day. They don't tell you that. And that each liter is saturated with hundreds of millions, if not trillions, minimum, per liter of anthropogenic man-made isotopes that are now going to be released into the environment and will poison people for millenniums in species. And you can't have a conversation because all it does is lie to us. The International Atomic Energy Agency is not even the agency's friend. They're the enemy of 8 million species. Is scientific fraud rife at the International Atomic Energy Agency's laboratories? We have 52 votes with 94% of the people that have a moral compass. And bless your hearts for that, by the way. IAEA Laboratory conducts analysts. They have over 500 laboratories that they perform tests with. So 500 laboratories are compromised because they work with the International Atomic Energy Agency. In order to pair up with the International Atomic Energy Agency, your number one job is to lie. So now you can see you're talking about a huge amount of resources 
put there to convince you that they're right and that I'm wrong and most people are going to believe them because the truth is unappealing for most people. Disgusting, despicable, revolting scum. And that's what they are. Mink whale been found dead at the St. Lawrence River. An orca found dead at the French River. Dwarf sperm whale found in Bangladesh for the first time. A dwarf sperm whale found for the first time ever in the Irish coast. These are not things, this is just a short time frame. These abnormalities now are the norm. Finding them in their, their normal spots for millions of years is, is, is not normal. So we're talking about it earlier at the beginning about in the center all the bird flu die-offs, because we're going to talk about that in a second. I got some doozies for you from yesterday. My God, you wait till you see what I'm going to show you. Starvation causes mass bird deaths, not the bird flu, which was originally attributed to, and, what, and is still attributed to all the communities for a thousand miles one way, a thousand miles the other way, but in the dead center of that, the community checked themselves, the birds were all emaciated. And, and it wasn't just one type of bird like the claim, it was also seagulls and ducks and terns and camarants were showing up emaciated. No highly pathogenic avian influ influenza was found, none. The birds were emaciated. That's the consensus, they died of starvation. And that's important for a couple of stories coming up right away that are just doozies. This story, and this is just one species, the Danny Long Legs. And you might recognize them now, right? Big, they can't bite you, they can't harm you, but they're very big, they look like mosquitoes. And there's this instant fear associated with them. They only live for a couple of days. An estimated 200 billion crane flies are ready to hatch because they had a drought, right? And insect charity bug life. And so whenever I heard the word charities, they always seem to be what you call control opposition. Now this one is pretty innocent, so I'm not going to point fingers, but that's typically, it's very unusual, especially Britain is notorious for this routine, Literally incapable of hurting a fly. If you find one, you catch it gently and release it outside. They don't sting and are harmless. And what does a single species of insect, what is their, their dent on earth? What, what does it do? To, their breakfast, lunch, and dinner for birds, bats, amphibians, spiders, and other insects, reptiles, and fish, which are building up reserves to see them through the winter. Their larvae enrich the soil, turning dead organic matter into nutrient-rich materials. So that's an incredible legacy. Just a single species have all of these incredible, wonderful, amazing attributes. Scorching summer with no rain to affect them in their underground tunnels means there could be a record number. A record number. Once airborne, they only live for a couple of days. So let them live out their lifespan. Don't kill them. They're harmless. And they contribute so much to the starving species that it remain. It should be a crime to hurt them. This story just cracks me up in the complete disregard for reality. Hundreds of dead gulls found as unprecedented avian flu outbreak continues in Nova Scotia. This is a major media. But when I looked at the first picture, I was like, huh, that bird looks like he's been dead for a long time. But it gets, it gets really interesting. Now, 
because I, I know an awful lot about seagulls in particular. So if a seagull dies, and say there's 10,000 seagulls and we're on the ocean, and a seagull accidentally gets in the net or gets on one of the hooks and dies, and when it comes back to the surface, we take it and we throw it back into the ocean. Because that happens, right? The 10,000 birds will go up uh, straight up in the air for about a quarter mile up in the air and they'll circle and they'll wait for the boat to move away from the dead seagull and then they'll all come down and land around the seagull but they'll stay several meters away from the dead seagull and they'll, um, they'll start making their Pacific noise like they're mourning. I've, I've seen it many, many times in both oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, by the way. And I've never seen that behavior with any other bird. So that's important to remember for coming up. Now, Digby, Nova Scotia, I actually dove that shoreline in Digby, Nova Scotia. That's a 52-foot tide exchange. So you used to have to bring a marker which you connected to the surface so that the speedboats could track you. Because when you went down with a tank of air, you couldn't, you couldn't work against the tide because it's so powerful. And it would bring you several kilometers down the coastline. It was horrific. But anyway, uh, I'm familiar with Digby and Beer Island. And Dr. And this is, he's a retired doctor, I think. Knew something was amiss when he spotted a couple of seagulls acting oddly. He said, I could see that there was an awful lot of scavenging going on. You can see a gull or two picking away at something dead on the beach. Again and again, repeatedly again, down the straight shoreline, as I could see it. So I thought there must be some substantial mortality going on. That's a bizarre, absolute bizarre way to frame that narrative. But when you look at him, you get creep, you get the creeps right away. There were skeletons remains, skeletal remains all over the place. Often it was just a wing or breastbone, no flesh whatsoever, and sometimes feathers. So there was just pure carcasses remaining. He said it was impossible to know how many seagulls died on the island because the tides washed the carcasses in Annapolis Basin twice a day and the number is definitely in the hundreds. Well, you know, the tide could have washed them up in the first place if that's the case, right? If the tide can wash them away, the tide can certainly have washed them up. He believes highly pathogenic avian influenza is to blame for the die-off. He believes. Okay. It gets really bizarre now. He believes influenza is very unlikely it's anything else. Now, we've had mass starvations going on on the coastline for on towards a decade. So to suggest that it can't be anything else is absurd. And because it takes a long time for them to deteriorate to just skeletons, it implies they've been there for a very long time. And skeletons don't float on and off the beaches, by the way. They sink. The town of Digby recently asked people to stay off the island because of the Atlantic Veterinary College said it's been an unprecedented year for avian influenza in Atlantic provinces and across the continent. In the first six months of the year, the Atlantic Office of the Cooperatives does about 300 diagnostic tests on wildlife, despite the fact that avian influenza has never jumped to wildlife. And this year they did 1,400 tests, which still doesn't mean nothing. But these carcasses, there's no way that you can determine it was avian influenza. They're going to congregate and there's no social distancing. Think about that statement. He's talking about dead birds on an island and he mentions the word social distancing. 
there's a, there's a complete disconnect. This is not how an expert should be talking on this subject. The province has received reports of dead birds in every county, which was the same on the East Coast in April, and they, had, they were all starved to death. Don't touch the birds or refrain from feeding the birds. So don't get close enough to see if they're emaciated. Now, they claim that, this is interesting, North America's outbreak of the highly pathogenic avian influenza began in Newfoundland last December. Despite in April of this year, Newfoundland is where I'm to right now, by the way, which was on a little farm by St. John's. And they claimed there was influenza, and so they killed a lot of the... This was a, not a farm. This was a, a uh, sanctuary for birds. So they claimed to start it in December, yet in April, all the locals for 600 miles of the coastline had reported the birds were emaciated. Newfoundland. So it started on the east, very tip of the east coast of the uh, north of North America, the most easterly point in North America. And last December, they discovered the virus at an ex exhibition farm. After that, a case showed up in the Canadian goose. Canadian goose in Nova Scotia, which is this story right here. So there was a single goose found dead and they called it avian influenza. So they had a couple of cases in Newfoundland, then Halifax, which is hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away, just a single bird. And then other birds in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. So you're heading up to St. Lawrence on the interior of Canada. And in the intervening months, the virus spread throughout the continent after sweeping across Europe last year. Now, what? this is another picture of nothing but bones. They said it was found in foxes in Nova Scotia, harbor seals in Quebec, and it had been found in skunks, raccoons, bobcats. These are completely unprecedented anywhere on the planet. And we covered these original headlines uh, back when it happened. But in the very middle of all of it, where these story came out, was that it wasn't influenza, that all seagulls, ducks, terns, camarants, and other birds that were washing up did, and was, the government called it influenza, when they tested it themselves, was starvation. But everybody else sent their samples to the government, and it came back bird flu. But when they checked themselves, the birds had all died of emaciation from starvation. And the frightening part of the story is, I'm the only person having that conversation. So, finding this, you and then say, that's the influenza, that's the avian flu. The, the, the retired scientist that made that discovery probably should spend the rest of his life in jail for for perpetrating these types of propaganda crimes against their country. When the seagull dies, other seagulls pick at and eat the carcass. That's the exact opposite of what I've seen my entire life. That's the one thing the seagull doesn't do. And a seagull is a despicable creature, don't get me wrong. It'll actually eat baby rabbits. I know because I unfortunately seen videos of it from my brother who was in trouting and actually caught it on camera. But they don't eat other seagulls. Spreading avian influenza by eating the dead seagulls, right? Uh, the whole industry is insane. Transmission of the virus to humans could cause a global outbreak. So is, is are they suggesting that's the next pandemic is going to get blamed on this? The extermination machine? 
most of the sickness worldwide is from radiation fallout contaminating the food, the drinking water supplies. Hundreds of dead gulls found as unprecedented avian flu outbreaks. What a disgusting parasite he turned out to be. Well, that's why we, that's the norm with these people, though, isn't it? That's what we expect from these people. Dead whales spotted at, now that's emaciated. Despite the fact that it's bloated, it's pretty obvious it's emaciated. So, uh, dust mass approaches Quetar, Saudi Arabia, low visibility predicted. So the dust particles are massive particles compared to radiation fallout, yet they can travel and cover tens of thousands of square miles. But the industry worked diligently to try to persuade people that radioactive fallout from Japan couldn't reach Canada or the United States. What's flying these days must be safer. This was an interesting story, I thought. Um, the Mining Journal, which was a strange... At least 13,500 hawks, along with several other species of hawks, some turkey vultures, are migrating. 13,500 hawks. Can you imagine what kind of diet they need under migratory it's an amazing bird we never had any birds visit our campsite for three days and blue jays were all observed flying westward along the lake michigan shoreline to the edge of the two communities before turning southward broad rings are known for southbound migration we've seen large numbers in places um, in Duluth, I don't know where that's to, in southern Texas, where 100,000 hawks pass on their way to Central and South America. I would love to see something like that. Canadian geese, common loons, are beginning to make their move out of Canada and Alaska, which is getting pounded as we speak by a hurricane, by the way, of just incredible proportions. Loons will head out to the Atlantic Ocean for the winter. The young will remain in the spring, and adults will make it back next spring. Geese will only go as far as they need to find open fields, open water, and large flocks will overwinter around industrial parks. Industrial parks. Because they're warm, right? Warm water from the industry. It's disgusting. Retention ponds, which are just evil. Some impressive numbers of wood ducks are being seen at the Gwyn Sewage, Sewage Lagoon. Like, in all honesty, birds shouldn't be migrating to sewage lagoons. They're there because their normal habitat isn't available, is destroyed, in other words. Nearly 100 were at the sewage, and some of the ducks will flock over winter. We get winter ducks here, right on the East Coast. I, I love ducks, eh? they're amazing. It's just an amazing looking creature. A great wall wave of fall migrants pushing through the Upper Peninsula earlier this week. Some of large contributors have been common loons, American pipits, thrusters, Sparrows, broad wing hawks. So, what do they eat? House sparrow mostly feeds on insects when they're young. Uh, they like seeds and spiders and grit and grasshoppers and crickets and bugs and ants and sawflies and beetles and house sparrows like whatever food are abundant to feed their young. And have been observed stealing prey from other birds, including American robins. And thrust uh, are small to medium sized ground living birds that feed on insects and other invertebrates. 
And the diet of the pipits is dominated by small inter invertebrates, insects are the most important prey. The flies and their larvae, beetles, grasshoppers, crickets, tree bugs, uh, uh, and amphibs, spiders, ants, larvae, uh, moths, butterflies, etc., etc. So these are all insects, small mammal species eating uh, migratory birds. Broadwing hawks, like uh, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, uh, frogs, fish, insects, chipmunks, shrews, voles, which are like little hamsters, frogs, lizards, and sometimes nesting birds like cardinals. They've been observed feeding on insects like grasshoppers, frogs, lizards, snakes, crabs, small mammals. And so they don't have much time left, in other words, because these species are disappearing. In 2020, they had millions of these insect-eating birds starved to death. There was 190 different species when it was all said and done. And we covered it for about two weeks when the headlines were coming out constant. They, had, they ruled out poisoning, diseases, and parasites. And they arrived at starvation. Because the majority of the birds they examined had depleted fat deposits, empty stomachs, small amount of blood, kidney failure, and shrunken flying muscles. In other words, they were emaciated. And they said they didn't identify a single direct cause of death, despite the fact that there's starvation and they were emaciated. <coughs> Caused by long-term starvation. And seed production was low and insect numbers are low. It was 192, I think it was, different species. And there were the migratory birds, much like we just showed you earlier. So just because you see them, don't mean they're not starving to death. Okay, so I was also going, I got three shows ready to go. This is one of them tonight, right? Over the weekend, I've been a, uh, my my hip is still brutal. I'm on painkillers for two days. And I kind of hoped that was going to pass. I thought that was just because I didn't take a chair with me when we were camping looking for insects and birds and, and fish and that, that are missing, by the way. I still got a bad hip. I got to get into the doctor in a few days. About... Uh, cancer to see how that's going the ecology of non-ecological -eco speciation non-adaptive radiation these studies uh, what I was trying to the story I'm trying to tell with this is that how radiation they, they understand radiation really well they'll say we don't know the effects on low level per se low level so called low-level radiation, but 220 million atoms per liter of iodine-129 is not low-level radiation in radioactive fallout per liter of rainfall. 20 million atoms of iodine-131 is not low-level radiation, folks. It's high-level. 450,000 times background of xenon-133 is not low-level radiation. And in order to have that and uh, sulfur peroxide, hydrogen, buckyballs, and everything else, you had to have curium isotopes, uranium isotopes, plutonium, americium, neptuniums, strontium, um, and just a thousand other fission products. Chronic radiation-induced uh, kidney failure, basically, is what we're talking about. Uh, to test preventive uh, therapeutic strategies limit their morbidity has been loose because of the high rodent mortality associated with acute radiation injury to the bowels, radiotherapy uh, injury. So they're trying to study uh, liver damage from radiation, but because in order to give them liver damage, they, 
damage the other organs too, right? Diverse, as I showed you earlier, by the way, diverse functions uh, to lethal radiation. So they've studied many facets. This is made naturally in your body, but uh, stem cells from the spleen instead of the damaged bone marrow. They were able to use stem cells, I noticed in a lot of studies, to help mitigate some of the damage from radiation. I'm starting to see that quite a bit, I noticed. Radiation-induced oxidative stress, toxicity to the testicles of mice. So they understand radiation illnesses and radiation uh, minutiae and and so if they used this plant extract it could help apparently with radiation according to the study which you see a lot of that too right but it's only applicable for very specific stuff I don't see how it wouldn't be applicable for other stuff but in the brains of non-human primates. So when they say they don't know much about radiation, they're liars, aren't they? Because I have 2,000 of these studies that I'm slowly shifting through, and I was saving them because I was starting to see these patterns. Radiation injury repairs. You got all these people with their names on the study in the blue right there. They're not producing the study because they're bored. So survival rates of radiated mice can significantly increase from 0 to 30% after the treatment. Which is really interesting because we see a whole lot of that already in just this little bit I showed you of these different solutions they were coming up with. But these are specific for specific doses basically may mitigate radiation injuries again. You see all the people with their names on the study. So they probably got a solution for themselves is what I'm seeing. Radiation protection in an animal research unit with PET. Well, the word animal research unit and PET shouldn't be together in the same sentence. Occupational doses and dose rates produced by animals. Occupational doses and dose rates Occupational. This is where they're trying to convince your children to go work for them in nuclear radioactive zones by using animal studies. The problem with an animal study is that the animal's kidneys are typically 50% more efficient or 50 times more efficient, not 50%, but 50 times more efficient at filtering plutonium and other uh, radiation than a human's kidneys are in excreting it, right? So in that context, humans will get sick 50 times quicker with the comparative doses. Fasting reduces intestinal radiotoxicity. But then they got to throw the big turd in the punch bowl by enabling dose escalator radiation therapy. So like the... They want you to fast to get radiation out of your body so they can give you more radiation. These are lunatics. This is a definition of insanity, by the way. Times infinity, right? Oh, and, and the doses that they were given the mice, my goodness, 11.5 grays. And a, a gray is, when it comes to alpha, beta, and neutron, is the same as a sievert. But in gamma, it's 20 times more. So it'll be 20 sieverts. It'll be 20 times, if they're using gamma, then that would be 20 times 11.5. So you must be talking about beta. I don't know. And then, think about this one. A fatal dose of radiation is equal to eating 80 million bananas. 
uh, first off, your body regulates. That's if you ate it all at the one time. Apparently, you would get a fatal dose of potassium, but that's not true either, because uh, no matter what you eat, if you eat an exceptional large amount of anything, it'll it'll be a fatal dose, right? So it's it's absurd to suggest to equate bananas have a banana equivalent dose you can't simply can't call a banana uh, uh, equal to 0 0.1 microsiever um, uh, that's absurd to suggest that a banana has like you can't make a, a dirty bomb or nuclear weapons out of potassium your body regulates it with homeostasis which means you can only bioaccumulate an X amount of potassium that your body needs, right? You'll only, because there's potassium in everything. You can't touch anything that doesn't have potassium in it. Like the microphone cover, the paint, you name it, my sweater, everything got potassium. Your body regulates it. It's like the, it's like the thermostat regulates the temperature in your house or cruise control regulates the speed of your vehicle. It's something that's done automatically. Your body regulates potassium, magnesium, iron, and you can only have so much. But man-made radiation, you, there's no limit. Well, until it kills you. But there's no limit. You bioaccumulate it. But it's a despicable thing to equate bananas. And for the first couple of years after Fukushima, we had to curb stomp everybody because everybody was using the word banana in the industry. To the point after about three years, they stopped using the word banana and potato chip, which almost everybody used. And we probably hit 500 videos where we came out and challenged the pundits and apologists and the PSYOP uh, with that narrative, right? What was this about? The ankles of the mice were treated with 40 sieverts. With 40 sieverts. So they must have put the ankle through a lead shield and blasted it with proton. My God. These are savages, eh? It's a despicable industry. When you see studies like that, the average radiation dose from a dominal x-ray is 0 0.7 milligrays or 0 0.0007 grays. For x-rays and gamma rays, the gray is numerical, the same value when expressed in sieverts. Uh, I'm sorry, for alpha particles, not, did I say gamma? For alpha particles, one gray is equivalent to 20 sieverts. That's my mistake. A whole body acute exposure to five grays or more of high energy radiation usually leads to death within 14 days. You're talking about five sieverts. Let me go up and play that clip from Thompson of Harvard University. There's two of those clips. Let me play them. He's going to talk about... And uh, uh, this is after in Fukushima. the U.S. context, we think of REM, and I assume in the Japanese context, people would think of sievert. Uh, the uh, fatal dose uh, from whole body exposure, uh, median dose is around uh, 350, 400 um, REM, or three and a half to four sievert. Delivered pretty quickly. Uh, delivered uh, over a period of uh, hours. Um, but in that case, death would follow over subsequent weeks. Okay, so three sievers over a few hours, you're going to die over the next week or two. Um, but that, that gives you an indication of the sort of hazard that you're concerned. So a, f a few sieverts, if, you, if, you're, if the dose looks as though it'll be more than two or three sieverts um, over a period of plume passage, for example, then you know that you're in a potentially lethal situation, whereas speaking in microsieverts is not helpful. Speaking in microsieverts. Let 
back down here where I left off. It's 698, which is almost through it. Yeah, it's just like 720 to all together. We're at 689. That's where we left off, right? Environmental behavioral radioactive particles and transfers to animals. Environmental behavior. The radioactive fallout and how it transfers to animals. So there's no way they don't know the difference. Risks of radiation exposure to children and their mothers. There's no way they don't understand what happened at Fukushima because the, this is just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the studies that we got. Proton radiation induced cancer. Pregnancy outcome after first trimester exposure is the ionizing radiation. So as most children exposed during pregnancy uh, won't graduate school basically or dysfunctional for the rest of their lives. Effects on adult cognitive functions after neonatal exposures. The clinically relevant doses of ionizing radiation and ketamine in mice. Decontamination after radiation exposure. Well, if you breathe it in, you, you're in real trouble. Distinct response of adult neural stem cells to low versus high dose ionizing radiation. Distinct responses. Your stem cells gets killed off and then you can't repair the damage, see? Long-term exposure to 4G smartphone diminishes the male's reproductive potentials by directly disrupting um, important chemicals in their testicles. Rats exposed to 2.45 gigahertz non-ionizing like your mobile phone in your house exhibit behavior changes with increased brain functions, expressions. So you expect to see the same thing in your pets, your dogs, and your cats to be harmed by um, the 2.4 gigahertz frequency, which is a lot of things in people's homes that are wireless or that frequency. Now, this, that kind of radiation is different from nuclear radiation, but it's still very harmful, isn't it? And there's a lot of it, right? It's prolific. So the bird communities, they've studied heavily and how infrared radiation causes issues in your gut um, bacteria. So probiotics are, are probably a good idea for people that are under siege. You can get it at your local supermarkets. Quantitative analysts of the amount and localization of radioactive gold nanoparticles interacting with cancer cells to optimize radiation therapy. So they're trying to put nanoparticles of radioactive gold around cancer to interact with the cancer. These are all fantasy pipe dreams. Um, like So how do I put it? Basically, it's it's insane, right? They were, they're giving you poison, and man-made radiation is two billion times more toxic than industrial poison. Two billion times more toxic. Uh, like they they've been you know way back in the day they were using radium where they had jugs made of radium or infused with radium, they, would fill it, they want you to fill it up with water and drink the water out of it each day, which is radioactive water. And what happened was people were dying from just horrific radiation illnesses, like where their jaw bones would come out, their teeth would fall out. It was, just, it was horrific, horrific. Uh, they were doing uh, uh, radium suppositories, Radium toothpaste, radium makeup, and all of these, the people that used it would have got violently sick with cancers and illnesses and diseases, immune deficiencies. And despite the fact that one would get banned, they would come out with another one. 
radioactive lipstick, radioactive, like radioactive toothpaste, radioactive soap, radioactive uh, shampoo, radium, sh like you wouldn't believe the stuff, radioactive perfume, and glow in the dark radium paint for women and children to put on their lips and their eyelashes and stuff like that. It was really popular too, and they, they knew the harmful effects of it. So when you, when you, even when you go way back into the nuclear industry, you see this con unbelievable contempt for all humans. It, and it is, right? It's 100% contempt. It's a complete disregard. When there's no checks. It's not illegal to poison you. Congress and parliaments worldwide don't have the authority, have abrogated their responsibilities and, and left it in the care of the non-regulatory agencies they call themselves a regulatory agency, but they're not. We've never seen any examples of them being regulatory agencies. Ecological effects of exposure to enhanced levels of ionizing radiation. So they, let's be clear, they don't have, there's zero possibility they don't understand the harm. It's zero. That the academic community, the universities, the nuclear students, the nuclear corporations, the nuclear power plant the engineers, the physicists, it's very clear they know the difference. It's very clear that they don't like you. And it's very clear that they're willing to poison you and have succeeded in poisoning the majority of the population of all species on the planet repeatedly. And it's very clear they take great pride in doing it. Environmental exposure to low doses of ionizing radiation and so destruct, destructive to the kidney. So low doses of ionizing radiation are destructive to the kidney of mice. Oxygen-guided radiation therapy. So hyper, one of the success stories for treatments of most illnesses is hyperbaric chamber treatment, where they compress you and feed you pressurized oxygen, high level oxygen, and that's able to get in because it's under pressure to places in your body that is lacking it. And it helps dramatically with recovery from all kinds of injuries and illnesses. So uh, the, another sickness of the nuclear industry is where they radiate your food and objects like, like clothing and, and towels and and uh, diapers and face cloths and stuff like this and socks coming into the country to try to kill any parasites they claim in it. Completely unnecessary. But you end up with radioactive material in your home. Like your smoke detector has americium-241, which, which is, you know, if you give it, put it in the incinerator, you're going to liberate it back into the environment, but what's in your house is always decaying. And they claim that there's no adverse side effects, but again, all they've really ever done in their entire legacy is lie to us, every facet of every conversation. Agents to enhance deficiency of chemotherapy of, or radiation in the pancreas cancer. But there's so many other ways you can treat an illness besides constant radiation. Defects of radio frequency radiation on mice, fetus weight, length, and tissues. And the implications obviously in our forest from the radioactive fallout is catastrophic. We got one more to get through. Blood-brain barrier in male and female rats. Electromagnetic radiation and permeability of blood-brain barrier, radio frequency. And uh, they, they, they discovered that uh, radioactive fallout, think of radioactive fallout from a nuclear accident, that those isotopes can be excited by radio frequency. And what does that mean? Well, it's in your body's pulse and energy every second, at this, almost at the speed of light. 
But with the right radio frequency, it could pulse a lot worse for sustained periods. And they know that. And no doubt they're taking advantage of it, which is like 5G, no, no doubt what they're up to. I showed you a study about 4G, and that ain't good, was it? You gotta realize that this stuff covered our planet. This model is only 19 days after the first detonation. It's a wicked industry. It can't be rehabilitated. It's completely evil from top to bottom. It's captured your schools, your universities, your medias, key positions in your government, key corporations. I see Oliver Stone, we're going to cover tomorrow night, came out and sold his soul for the nuclear industry with incredible propaganda, horrific propaganda, teamed up with Joshua Goldstein, who we've covered quite a few times over the years, by the way, for being a perp in the nuclear industry. A despicable perp on top of that. A very dangerous, hateful perp. A criminal, a 100% criminal. Just like the International Atomic Energy Agency have betrayed their Hippocratic Oath, but they're just a corporation, so they didn't betray anything. That's what they've been up to all along. That's why they were created in the first place, wasn't it? Is scientific fraud riff at the IAEA laboratories? 58 votes, 93%. And how could you vote no? How can anybody vote no? When the, the evidence is inconceivably overwhelming. Oh, we work like a dog. It's the best, that's all I got. It's nonstop. Two hours, is it? One hour, what is it? What have we got done here? Like two hours and ten minutes of just nothing but documentation. Just an absurd amount of documentation. I got three of these shows ready to go over the weekend. This is the one, first one of them. <laughs> what did you do the weekend, Dana? I went to war for you and your friends and your families and your loved ones. I went to war. That's what I do every day. I go to war. Until you do too. At some point you will. Because you won't be, have no choice, right? So I appreciate the caller earlier, Gar, and our heart goes out to him in these difficult times. Even when you know it's coming, it's still difficult as hell. And there's so many of these stories every day, it's, can't keep up with it. Centrifugal force. Yeah, you are, unfortunately. Dana and Asana. Yeah, thank you, Dana. Appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Peace, where Richard. Lockhart, Robin. Stephen Young, no lizards in Las Vegas. Good night, Stephen. Good to see you, my friend. I hope you're doing okay. Another Gmail, Don Vincent. Christopher Thinker, Danny San. Peace, where John Curtis. Good night, everybody. A quick shout out to everybody if I can. Organic Slant, Timber Traveler, Kevin Blanche, Conrad.
James Lucid just a walk in the camera shine. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. So sad. The, the reality is so sad, isn't it? Angel's place. I don't call that. S is out there somewhere. Swanee D lost his kitten. Uh, he loves his kittens and his cats, folks. So it's a rough time for him. Darren James Spencer. What else we got here? Uh, Robert Cramp. Thank you. We're almost all the way up through the chat. I'll come back down to the recent comments in a second. John Shiflett, the Darlene Parole. Albert, I was just thinking about Albert. Where were you, Albert? It's interesting you showed up. Reading my mind, are you? Thank you, Centrifugal. Let's call her night. If you made it this far, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. And you should watch my video before the first 12 hours because they're going to remove it or add something to it at 12 hours. And so the best time to watch it is the first 12 hours, as far as I can tell. Because details are everything, and they're definitely friggin' with the details. These are terrible people, the International Atomic Energy Agency. They're completely terrible people. What, a, what an incredible betrayal. It's time for me to redo this picture. I can see that. It's, that doesn't quite do it justice of how evil they actually are. I got to get it together and fix that picture, Dana. Fix it. We should have the outboard motor. Uh, Rock Nemeth, hi there. We should have the outboard motor up and running sometime this week. I'm excited about that. The weather's not good, but I don't even give a shit anymore. I'm going. We're looking. We got to find out. If the world supports me, we will, I should say. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can, and uh, which is more than most people are doing, unfor unfortunately, right? I always hope to inspire people to do the same thing, and it didn't happen. And so we got to keep the candle burning. No matter how hard it is, I have to keep that candle burning in the hopes that the world comes to its senses, does the moral and ethical thing, and goes to war like me and like you. God bless everybody. Have a great night. Great day tomorrow. We'll see everybody tomorrow night. We'll be covering uh, Oliver Stone's new movie tomorrow night. That ought to be a riot. <laughs> I'm going to piss on him tomorrow. Have a great night. We'll see everybody tomorrow night. Take care, folks.
Uh, good night, everybody. We'll see everybody tomorrow night.